What's going on guys? It's Braxtech again, and today I have the HP Omen Max 16. This is the Core Ultra 9 275HX and RTX 5080 model that's available at Best Buy for $33.39. I believe it's actually on sale for $200 off, so $3100 is in change. This is not going to be a traditional review. This is going to be more of an in-depth analysis of what the stock thermal solution looks like, as well as the system temperatures under a max gaming load as well as a repaste tutorial, just in case you feel like replacing that cryo compound that uh, HP is touting, very similar to Element 31 from Alienware, with more aggressive solutions, but also more traditional. Uh, I'm going to be using Condeptonaut Extreme, a liquid metal on the CPU, as well as Phase Sheet, which is basically the equivalent of PTM 7950 from Honeywell, but offered by Thermal Grizzly as well on the GPU. So essentially, this is going to be a tutorial to show how to take advantage of the barriers in place from HP to prevent leakage and, you know, system shortages from, you know, the liquid metal leaking onto the system board, as well as what the thermals would look like before and after the repaste. Essentially showcasing, you know, how effective the stock or factory solution is from HP, as well as if there are any gains to be had by using something aftermarket. And also this is to serve as a video guide to take off the thermal solution entirely in case you have to, um, of course, because you need to remove the thermal solution to get to the first M.2 slot underneath a heat pipe, as well as the Wi-Fi card in case the Wi-Fi card dies on you. So without further ado, let's get right into it. Okay, so my testing methodology in variables. So I use Battlefield 2042, specifically in the Conquest 128 mode, which stresses both the CPU and GPU quite well, with unconstrained power limits. So I maxed out all of the sliders via the Omen Control Center. Um, and you'll see that it likes to load balance itself to around 250 watts of total crossload, just like their marketing material. So we'll see anywhere between 80 and 90 watts on the CPU and 150 to 160 watts on the GPU during the duration of the test. I had maximum fans set for both tests manually so that it doesn't, you know, variably change as the temperatures changed. I wanted to eliminate that as a variable. My room temperature was set to 71 degrees Fahrenheit or just under 22 degrees Celsius for both sets of tests. My laptop was raised uh, about an inch and a half in the rear uh, to showcase the best case scenario for airflow. And then lastly, I had hardware info running a log in the background of the 30-minute tests, and then I summarized them via an automated Excel tool that I had put together. Okay, so the pre-repaste thermal test results. So I have both the chart over the 30-minute run, as well as just a summarized table of all of the different sensors that we care about. So I have the average in the first column. Uh, of each sensor for the duration of the run with the respective units. And then what I like to use is the last two minute average after heat soak is achieved. So the CPU package averaged the high 80s, 88-ish, and was uh, just crossing the 90 degree threshold towards the very end of the test. The package power was great. You know, it was hovering at the high 80 wattage as well when, you know, even last gen, most gaming laptops were, you know, promising or touting between 65 and 75 watts uh, in a dual load scenario. GPU temperature was very respectable, uh, 73, 74 degrees, uh, peaked at around 75. And GPU power was very good as well, right? As I mentioned before, it, the system likes to load balance to around 250 watts total between 240 and 250. And then lastly, memory junction temperatures were nothing to be concerned about whatsoever. We were still uh, well under 80 degrees Celsius. Okay, so let's take this thing apart. We have six Phillips head screws. Uh, I believe I use Phillips head zero. And there's four across the top, uh, one of which is captive, and two in the bottom. So the first one that I actually unscrew here um, is captive, which like basically raises the panel a little bit for you to get a spooger or a guitar, like a pry tool underneath to disengage all the clips. So we'll go ahead and remove these six screws or well, five, the, <laughs> that, that sixth one would stay in. We grab our, you know, our pry tool and we start disengaging the clips from the opening that was uh, granted to us from the captive screw. We'll go ahead and go ahead, uh, go around the entirety of the laptop to make sure you disengage every single clip and that you don't break it uh, in case you, you somehow miss one. So you go around the back first and then to the sides and heading towards the keyboard deck as you'll see here. Now moving towards the deck and now we go across the front where the light bar is. 
Once you've disengaged all the clips, it's really easy to just pop this thing open and take a look at the beautiful vapor chamber on the inside. Um, before we start doing any work on it though, of course, we wanna make sure we uh, disconnect the battery in the bottom left-hand corner, as you'll see. So we'll want ahead and remove that before we start doing anything. Okay, next, we need to disconnect the two fan headers. So there's one on the left here that I'm pointing out, and then another one in between the SSD heat pipe. So there's a little plastic sticker that's covering the fan header on the left side. Uh, you could just pull that up and uh, disconnect it pretty easily. Just make sure you don't yank on them because they are very fragile, very small uh, cables. This one, I just used my Phillips head to basically unwind the uh, excess cable that was hidden underneath the heat pipe and then unplug that one. Uh, pretty straightforward. Now we need to start unscrewing some of the uh, the fan screws that are holding it in place. Uh, they are all captive, uh, which is actually a very pleasant surprise. So you don't have to like keep track of uh, varying lengths of different screws for the fan housing versus the vapor chamber. So we'll go ahead and start unscrewing those now. Okay, next, we want to take out this one Phillips head screw that is covering uh, the SSD, the first SSD drive uh, bay, so to speak. Um, this is the only screw you'll have to like keep track of outside of the bottom cover screws. And now we're going to move on to uh, loosening all of the captive screws for the actual vapor chamber. Um, again, they are captive, so you don't have to you know keep track of which one goes where. They will all stick in, uh, stay in place. Um, and it's a pretty straightforward process. You'll hear like the leaf spring like pop out. And then I'll just grab my spooger tool here and you want to find a spot where you won't like have a risk of bending it. I would I actually did the PCH area here. And once you feel the resistance finally pop from all of the thermal putty, it's pretty easy to just lift up. Um, in this case, you have to actually slide it downward towards you first to, to get the like heat fin array on both sides out. And then you could just pull away from you. So as you can see, we have the vapor chamber assembly here. Uh, CPU and GPU cold plates with the appropriate foam dam. Uh, and one of the things that's really unfortunate, uh, why I don't like this solution, is that the thermal paste and the liquid metal, the basically hybrid solution, disassociates. The thermal paste pumps out, and then there's like very small traces of liquid metal that are kind of just everywhere on both the cold plates on the vapor chamber side as well as the dyes, um, which leads to, you know, improper coverage and then you get some hot spots on the die as the paste migrates out and leaves the liquid metal there um so it's a mess uh so to clean this up i'm going to grab some high percentage ipa or isopropyl alcohol and then of course i have a bunch of q-tips uh, ideally that they're like tightly uh tightly tight fabric so that it doesn't leave a bunch of um like cotton behind as you clean it and i'm going to speed this process up it, it takes a little bit to clean up the remnants of the liquid metal what I like to do is clean up all of the paste first and then push the liquid metal into like a small ball and then pick it up with that same Q-tip to safely move it away to like a paper towel or something. So CPU is now clean. Let's go ahead and move on to the uh, GPU. This is again the 5080. Uh, again, there's a lot of thermal paste here, so I sped this footage up to make sure you guys don't have to sit around and watch me uh, struggle to pick up the little uh, ball of liquid metal that was left over from their uh, cryo compound hybrid solution. Uh, but, you know, very straightforward process, just isopropyl alcohol, Q-tip, and going back and forth, keep at it until the, the dye is nice and shiny. Okay. Now, now we need to move on to the vapor chamber cold plates as the CPU and GPU dye are clean. And it's the same process. Use isopropyl alcohol and the Q-tips to clean everything up. And as you notice, I'm actually pushing most of the liquid metal towards the middle so it doesn't get stuck in the foam dam. Uh, not the end of the world. That The whole point of the foam dam is to keep it from leaking. But uh, for my preference, I actually like to keep the liquid metal pushed towards the center and then pick it up with a Q-tip. Clean off the rest. Okay. GPU cold plate is now nice and clean. Now we got to do the CPU cold plate. 
Again, same process, not too complicated. I like to push all the liquid metal towards the center um, while cleaning up the paste residue at the same time. Okay, grab the rag, rub it off, and now it's nice and squeaky clean and shiny. So they are nickel plated, of course, so we don't have to worry about uh, the galvanization of the, of the liquid metal into the copper, so we don't have to worry about saturation. So I'm gonna go ahead and grab my conductinata stream and the uh, like very, very thin tip syringe. And I'm gonna zoom in here. This is all you need. Like it is the tiniest little drop. You don't need a lot for each component. I'm gonna do the CPU, so I'm gonna pick it up and very, very carefully bring this over the system board. You see how I have my hand underneath covering it to make sure I don't drop it on the board and apply it to the CPU. And now I'm gonna speed up this process again. Basically you wanna leave this very fine, even application where there's no pooling or an excess in any sort of corner. And you wanna make sure you get complete coverage. You don't wanna leave any spot of the dye bare. I'll bring this up here so you can see it a little bit better. But as you can tell, even with it slanted, the liquid metal's not moving or uh, pulling up in any area. So there's no you know, parts of the dye that are left bare either. So that, that should be nice and nice and tidy. Next, I'm gonna grab my phase sheet from Thermal Grizzly, and we're going to go ahead and cut it to size uh, for the GPU. Now, you could choose to do liquid metal here. Um, NVIDIA removed the hotspot temperature from uh, the 50 series cards, so it's impossible to tell if you have a perfect application or not. So I figured I'd simplify the process. Uh, GPUs run up quite a bit cooler anyway, um, and you know, apply that here. So. I have some tweezers so that I can remove the other side of the, uh, I guess, film, so to speak. So, uh, you know, after cutting it to size, I go ahead and apply it. Then once everything's lined up, I like to push it down. And what I typically do is I use my fingernail basically and uh, push down towards the excess, which basically like cuts it almost underneath the film. And then I grab the tweezers and remove the, the top of the plastic film now. And there's just a little bit of like excess towards the top of the die. But it makes it a very straightforward process without tearing anything. Bring this up close so you guys can see it. Nice complete die coverage for both the CPU and GPU. Now we're going to just apply a very, very small amount, as you can see again here, uh, to the CPU cold plate. And this will help ensure that you have proper coverage and no hot spots on the die. Um, it has proper mounting pressure and that there's sufficient uh, liquid metal uh, to have proper thermals after the application. So this doesn't have to be perfect in that it doesn't have to line up exactly perfectly with the CPU die. You can choose to measure it if so. Um, I usually eyeball it and 99 times out of the 100, it's, it's perfectly fine. So I just did the shape of the CPU die that'll match it up, cleaned up some of the excess in the corners and made sure that the foam was nice and tidy. Now it's time to mount this thing back. Um, if you notice that any putty has like moved significantly, uh, I would push it back with like a plastic pry tool, but um, I didn't have any severe issues. So make sure you just go ahead and slide those fin arrays underneath the rear uh, clips and then very slowly line it up and drop it into place. And then we're gonna have to start tightening all of these screws again. Okay, so now we're going to tighten each of the vapor chamber screws for the CPU and GPU cold plates, just one revolution at a time to make sure each of them start threading properly. Um, I basically turn to, towards the left until I hear a nice firm click while pressing down, and then do one or two revolutions towards the right to tighten them. Then you can follow the listed order. Um, they're numbered one through seven, I believe. Um, you could follow that specific order where you do two or three revolutions at a time. I also like to press down towards the center of the of the cold plate um, just to make sure that there's uh, proper coverage or proper mounting pressure. You do not have to do this. I, I just do it just because I'm used to it. Um, and then you go ahead and go around in that same order and finish up tightening everything. Then we're going to go ahead and take our last little SSD screw um, and make sure we put that back in. And now we're going to just tighten the uh, six fan screws that are once again captive and then go ahead and reconnect them. So on the right hand side, it's a vertical connector, so it's pretty straightforward. Uh, just click it into place and then you could hide the excess wire uh, underneath the heat pipe just as HP did. And then the other one is a horizontal connector, so it just kind of pops into place and you push in. Again, you just gotta be careful with the uh, very thin wire. Um, and then you could choose to put on the sticker uh, if you want to, and now we're just reconnecting the battery. 
Once everything is nice and tidy, we'll go ahead and grab our bottom panel once again. And it just uses a bunch of clips, like I said. So uh, make sure it's lined up nicely. You can choose to start uh, with the captive screw um, to get everything in into place. Um, I, and then go down the line, right? So four across the top. You have the two smaller ones in the bottom. And then clean it up. And we're going to go ahead and boot it up now. All right. Everything's booted, so we obviously didn't kill anything during the process. Uh, so that's a huge win. Now we're going to go ahead and move on to some post-thermal tests. Okay, so instead of uh, boring you guys with some more charts and tables, I decided to just record simply the gameplay for the last uh, two to four minutes of, of a match. Right. So essentially, we could obviously see the massive differences in CPU temperatures. So instead of being pinned towards, you know, the high, the high 80s, almost 90 degrees, we've shaved off about 8 to 9C across the average temperature on the CPU package. And then we're also pulling the same amount of power, right, between 85 and 90 watts. And the GPU, it didn't, there was not a really significant impact here, which I kind of expected the GPUs because they have a large surface area. Um, they often are fine with even like very okay pastes. Uh, of course, pump out is a completely different story, but for the most part, I settled in towards the low 70s. Um, the average for the run was just over 72 degrees Celsius. So about a one to two degree improvement. Um, but overall, I'm like very, very satisfied with the, with the improvement on the CPU specifically. Um, I think that is a massive win. It, it, basically 10 degrees for not too much work, about an hour of work um, is a massive win. And I think it will allow you to extract more performance across the board, especially in CPU only workloads. So in Cinebench, for example, I was able to drop about 15 degrees in a single in a single run. So CPU renders, things like that, you'll definitely see a, a much better improvement uh, in those workloads. Okay, so if you needed a too long didn't watch summary there was a two ish degree celsius drop on the gpu by using phase sheet after doing proper burn in cycles and then a uh, massive massive drop on the cpu close to 10 degrees celsius on the averages across the cpu package temperature um, by using conduct and not extreme it's clear that the cryo compound uh, <laughs> leaves a lot to be desired. Um, they tout that it gives you near performance of liquid metal while reducing the risks uh, that come with using it. However, because uh, naturally how normal non-conductive paste pumps out and migrates off the dye over time, essentially you're left with a bunch of just hot spots across the dye as the, pump, as the paste moves away. And then the liquid metal traces that are just left are just a huge pain to clean up. Uh, all that to say, do I recommend you, every single person that owns this laptop to go out and do this? No. I think you need a little bit of experience even with the safeguards that are in place before you do this, especially with how expensive this is. I think if you have a little bit of experience doing normal repastes with, you know, standard non-conductive materials, um, I think this is, uh, you know, fine to do so. Uh, it's not exactly crazy difficult to remember where all the screws go because everything is captive. Um, it's pretty easy to get in and it's also easy to, you know, screw back everything in place and there's only two fan connectors you have to disconnect. Long story short, it's not super complicated to get into the machine and start doing some work. Ultimately, I wish HP just went with a, the tried and true Honeywell phase change material, PTM 7950, or I believe it's technically 7958 uh, specifically for Lenovo, just because it eliminates all of the weird behavior where you'll see many of your cores in like the low to mid 80 degrees Celsius range, but your package is very regularly hitting, you know, 90, 95, 100 degrees, uh, as we've seen in some other YouTuber reviews of this machine. Um, and again, it's because the paste eventually pumps away, leaving just liquid metal, which is insufficient uh, contact between the cold plate and the dye. And then you're left with like very random throttling behaviors that you can't control. Then lastly, I just wanted to very quickly call out because it didn't respread the thermal putty. Um, there was no issues with like VRAM temperatures or anything. It was still under 80 degrees Celsius in the same test. I also tried an extremely heavy like A to 64 plus firmark load and there was no issues with like power delivery or like the VRM throttling. So everything should be good there. Well, that wraps this up. Uh, hopefully you guys learned something. Hopefully the Omen Max owners get a lot out of this and I look forward to seeing you guys in the next one.